Thank you for visiting CarverBanjos.com. This is the do-it-yourself travel banjo kit. My name is Brian Carver and in this video I'm going to show you how to put this kit together. I'll go over every little detail I can think of to help you put this together and towards the end I will play it and I'm going to bring out a couple of my other kit models so you can compare and contrast between the different kits. So let's get right to it. I wanted to design a kit that I could put in a really small box. Actually, I'm going to get some boxes that are even smaller than this. And, um, the shipping cost to send some of my kits like overseas or even just across the country are sometimes they're insane. So I'm hoping that using like a, a very small package um, we can make this even more affordable besides just the lower cost of this kit in general. So it comes like this. And uh, what allows me to use a smaller package um, is that our rim is two pieces. So it takes up a lot less space. Now, this kit will take a little bit more time to put together I think because it's really important that you uh, glue this joint here and you make sure that it's nice and strong before you actually tack the skin on. So it takes a little bit of patience to do this but uh, after a weekend you can have a plain banjo. So let's start putting it together. In your bag of parts, you'll find two little pieces of wood. These are called biscuits. It's actually one biscuit that I cut in half. And here we have these little grooves cut into the rim pieces. So get some wood glue in those grooves. along the whole face. And the two pieces will only go together one way. You can't do it either way because the grooves are offset so you'll know right away you have it going the wrong direction. Uh, use a damp towel to get all that extra glue off. It's easier to get it off while it's still wet instead of trying to sand it all off later. I just kind of tap it like this to get everything lined up perfectly. It's glued together but we need to apply pressure while the glue dries. So uh, I'm going to use a clamp. I know not everyone's going to have a clamp but uh, it's pretty easy to get. You get like 10 or 15 large rubber bands if you don't have a clamp. Just uh, put the rubber bands perpendicular to the joint so that will get some pressure on that joint. And the more the better. So you want as much pressure on there as you can. But I do have a clamp, so I'll be using it. Make sure everything's lined up. You see the glue starts to squeeze out of the joint there. It's pretty good. Damp towel. Good to get that glue before it dries. Alright, 
now let this rim dry a good 12 24 hours yeah I would just let it dry overnight and then we'll be able to tack the skin on it and it'll be nice and strong all right the rim has been drying I let it dry overnight here's a this is one of my production rims now when I'm making these I have to attach the piece of wood to my templates and uh, I use a small screw so you'll see these screw holes but these screw holes will be on the bottom side of the drum the drum will be resting on the dowel anyway right where these screw holes are so you'll never see them so uh, you can fill them with glue if you want and sand it kind of to create like a, a wood putty if you really want to hide these holes but it doesn't matter because when the banjo is put together you won't see them next I would recommend putting a varnish over the rim uh, before we tack the skin on now you don't have to varnish it you can just leave it natural but for this video we're gonna put a varnish on so um, you'll see here soon how I tack the skin on but we're not gonna varnish the parts of the rim that the skin will be covering there's no need to and we're gonna be using some glue as well uh, so the, the glue is not going to stick to varnish anyway so no point in varnishing uh, the top surface of the rim I'm only going to sand and varnish the back side of the rim all you need is like 320 grit sandpaper and get real quick Let's put some varnish on the back side and then once that's dried we can put the skin on. I'm using True Oil which is a gunstock finish. Um, it's kind of a thicker varnish so it doesn't take as many coats to get a nice shiny look. Um, people always ask me how, how to apply a finish. Um, I say just follow the directions on the bottle. But in general, use a, a rag, put a little bit on the rag, and rub it in the direction of the grain. Do a thin coat, let that set, do another thin coat. Do as many coats as you want, I usually do three. By the time you have three on there, you've got a nice a nice finish. So. so I'm only going to varnish this top surface and this inner part of the rim because that's all we're going to see once the skin's put on. So while we wait for the oil to dry on this, let's get the neck ready for oil. Um, this is the neck, this is the dowel. I got some 320 grit sandpaper and oh, there's no reason to sand the fretboard if you do you're, you're gonna be messing up the frets anyway I've already sanded the fretboards before I put the frets in so you just don't have to worry about it um, now you might want to sand this the peg head and you might want to sand the friendly scoop because those are things that I just kind of left alone. Um, and you'll especially want to sand like any like tight radius. Uh, you might see like a, a little bit of burning happened. Uh, this is because I'm using a, uh, a router bit to... Actually I'm using this router bit to round over these edges. And uh, when when you get into a tight a 
tight radius here, you might get a little bit of a burn. And uh, you can just take that off with the, with the sandpaper. It just takes a little bit of work, but it'll come off. Alright, here's the goat skin. That will be the drum head. And it's got this white powder on it. It's like a talcum powder. And that's how these skins are shipped to me, and I guess that's to keep them from sticking together. So, you'll get that. Put it in some, uh... This is just cold water. So we're going to let that soak for at least half an hour, just cold water, never ever use boiling water or hot water, there's no need for it, and actually boiling water will will ruin the skin, it'll cause it to uh, like shrink and wrinkle up. I'm just using the water that's run off from my uh, steam bending rig. So making use out of what we have. I'm going to let this soak for a good 30, 40 minutes. You can let it soak as long as you want. You could, you could soak it for days and uh, it will make no difference. Let's go into our bag of parts and we'll find three brass screws. Now the back side of the dowel has inset holes and the top side of the dowel you can see has a slight angle. Now you could glue right here if you want that extra strength but I think that the three screws will do the job just fine and since this is a travel banjo let's leave the option open to to be able to take it back apart if we want to. Um, so we can uh, break it down even more and Maybe then it'll fit in a, in a suitcase or something. So I think it's a good option to just leave leave this unglued. I'm going to use a power drill. You can just use a screwdriver. Just make sure that you don't over tighten these screws. Uh, you just want them nice and snug. They're brass, so they're a little bit softer, and uh, they might snap if you over tighten them. So, Make sure that the neck and the dowel are aligned. And just give it one last, one last little turn, and we're ready to put the varnish on this now. Just nice and thin and cover everything and we're going to be really careful to keep varnish from going into the peg holes and uh, into this slot here as well. Uh, I'm just going to varnish everything. If you're doing the coats thin enough you don't really have to worry too much about getting it in the holes. If you're doing like a thick coat, it might drip down in there. When I do the fretboard, just wipe the frets clean so you don't build varnish up on the frets. Okay, 
we're about ready to tack the skin on. I went ahead and drew a line with a pencil. Um, this is where I want to put the tacks in. So the skin's going to be stretched across the top of this and then down onto the side and the tacks are going to go around here. Uh, I think it might be a good idea to round this edge because the skin's going to be pulled over it. So I'm just going to use a flat file. You could do this with some sandpaper. I think it's important to put a layer of glue along this edge. So um, the, the tacks will be holding the skin in place, but with a layer of glue, it's kind of taking all the stress off of each little tack. And it might make a difference if your banjo is exposed to some sudden change in humidity, like say you take it from outside in the humidity to inside and with the the heat on uh, this will cause the skin to shrink rapidly so this layer of glue I think can make a big difference and might be able to save the skin keep it from uh, pulling through the tacks now Here's the skin, just pulled it out of the tub of water, and you can see that talcum powder residue is still there, so you can wipe it off. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to dry the skin off here, I'm just trying to get all that extra water. So we don't need to have the water dripping everywhere. Now this stage, people people get worried that the skin is drying out and they're not going to get it on in time. Take your time with this, because you really only get one shot with it. This skin will stay wet and pliable for a long time. You'll have like a good hour to work with it, so just don't worry about it. We'll go back to our bag of parts and take the tacks out. I've got this little tack hammer and I've wrapped it in masking tape kind of just to protect to protect the surface of the tack from getting all scratched up. You can lay the skin on either way. There's no wrong way to do it. Just pick whichever way you like. And then we're going to start with four tacks. These first four tacks are pretty important. Now I already marked a line with the uh, pencil on the side of the rim. And I'm just going to try to space each tack out evenly. I get it started by hand, kind of wiggle it into place, and then tap it the rest of the way. It's kind of an art form to get these tacks to go in straight, but I send along extra just in case you bend a few. So we're doing the four corners first, um, across from each other, You 
know sometimes I will actually just uh, measure out where I want the tacks and I will pre-drill with a 1 16th inch drill bit. I didn't do that today but um, that's something you can do to make it a lot easier to put these tacks in. See now I'm pulling three or four pounds of pressure. Just, just pulling it tight. You don't have to overdo it. fourth tack. Just kind of pulling it tight, wrapping it around so it holds itself. Wiggle it into place. And I'm taking the tack all the way down. I'm seating it. Okay, so now we have the first four and you see just a little bit of a wrinkle here so the next four we're going to split the originals and again we're going to pull with each tack and that's going to take the wrinkles out say once you've done about 16 tacks, um, the wrinkles should be gone. You can see it's not it's not overly tight. It's just got an even tension on it. Now I'm just gonna keep splitting the difference here in a crisscross pattern. Alright, the last one. Somehow I managed to not bend any tags. So it can be done. Alright, now you see. Um, skin covers the whole, the whole rim. But it's just this inner part that's going to be vibrating, making the sound. So keep that in mind. It kind of gives the illusion of a full banjo drum, but um, it's, it's all a design choice to get this all as compact as possible. And uh, I wanted to have a model, a kit model, that wasn't using a steam bent rim. I, I needed to uh, come up with something that was just a lot easier for me to make, and this works great. So now you can let the skin dry overnight or um, we can trim the skin right now and we'll just do it right now. Got this razor blade. I'm just gonna go around the edge.
you know, in hindsight, maybe I should have used a little more glue along the edge while I was talking, so it kind of dried up. So keep that in mind there. Now we're going to let this dry, let it dry until it's no longer cool to the touch. That's, that's how you know that the water's out of it. So I always just, it's evening right now, I, I do this before I leave the shop and in the morning when I come back it will be ready to put together. So the skin has been drying for a good 10-12 hours. pressure on it and uh, it doesn't really budge. It's nice and tight. It's, it's perfect. The oil has dried on the neck. I think it turned out pretty nice. So we're ready to start putting this together. Now here's something I want to point out. And this is kind of a personal preference thing. The, the way I spaced the tacks out. So when you put this together, you can have it where the tacks are resting against the, the neck joint here. And there's going to be a little gap. You can leave it like that if you want. But really I think it will look a lot nicer if if I uh, move those tacks out of the way because I want it to sit flush and this is something you could think about before you tack the skin on I admit I've kind of uh, rushed into this project uh, because I've already started selling these kits and now I really need to get this video done so this is kind of my most rushed assembly video I've done but. so I think I'm gonna pull these three tacks out, move two of them off to the side, and leave a nice open space. To pull a tack out, I use a small flathead screwdriver. So I, I still want to move these two off to the side. I'm using this uh, center line kind of as reference. This is where the two halves of the rim were glued together. You can kind of see it here. And uh, that way I know that everything's centered. And I'm just going to mark this with a pencil. Okay, now I've got lots of space for the neck. I think that looks good. Now we'll go back to our parts bag and get the tailpiece. You see the tailpiece has a hole cut for the dowel, and it's just going to go on like that. Now. 
there's nothing that's going to like permanently attach this drum to the neck. It's just the strings, once you get the strings on and tune it up, the tension of the strings is going to be pushing this, this drum down and it's going to keep everything in place. And also, uh, because it's a travel banjo, I thought about this, I wanted, I wanted to be able to remove this drum. So all you'll have to do is loosen the strings and the drum will slide out. Then you can, of course, unscrew this if you want to break the instrument down even more. And uh, it's, it's very portable that way. So I'll show you how to tie the strings onto the leather tailpiece. The strings are all numbered, one through five. Um, number one is on the right side, two, three, four, five is on the left side. It's easiest to tie all the strings on at once and then put the tailpiece on the instrument instead of uh, stringing it, tuning it up, trying to tie the, the next string on. So that's what we're going to do now. Okay, string number one. So I put the string through the top, uh, give it a few inches, and then twist it around one, two, at least three times. Then the string goes back through that eye that you've created and pull everything tight. And for good measure I like to just tie a, a simple knot. Pliers help pull everything tight. So it's a slip knot. It's really important that you get a good knot on here because the instrument it won't stay in tune unless the string is tied really well. Twisted it three times, back through the eye, pull it tight, and then I will uh, just tie another knot on itself, just a simple knot. and we'll just pull everything straight. And also this is kind of cool, I like to uh, catch the previous string with the next knot. Because if you do leave the uh, extra just, uh, just dangling wherever, you might actually hear it when you're playing. It, it kind of buzzes, you might hear a buzzing sound. So if you hear that, it's very possible that you're your string, your extra string is doing that. So I try to keep everything um, short up tight. Alright, almost done. Here's the last string. Twist, twist, twist. Back through. Pull tight. And then tie a knot, the extra, just for good measure. And now I've been trying to snake all these extra bits back through another knot. Just to keep everything out of the way, keep everything secure. So that's how I tie these. If you have a better idea, you can 
definitely do it. Um, you need a really strong knot here that doesn't slip. That's the important thing. And uh, I'd like to share with you how I make these strings. These are actually classical guitar strings. So when it comes time for you to replace your strings, um, you can find them. Uh, they're very cheap, and like any music store will have them. You can buy them online. Um, they're very cheap. They last a long time, and I think they sound better than most uh, minstrel banjo string sets. Um, like I've I've always been really disappointed with the way a lot of uh, minstrel sets sound or how long they last like uh, if you get like expensive gut strings uh, they might wear out after a couple weeks these will last for a very very long time so obviously a guitar has six strings and this banjo has five so the first string on the banjo is this one second third and fourth that's a wound string wound that's the fourth string and then of course the fifth string well we don't really have one in this set so you could buy an extra first guitar string and use that as your fifth banjo string 0.028 what I like to use, instead of wasting a, another set of strings, I like to use fishing line for the fifth string. This is 50 pound monofilament. So um, it's technically, I guess it's a different type of material. I believe that fishing line is like a fluorocarbon string. And these are just simple clear nylon strings. So um, I don't think it really makes a big difference for this type of a banjo. It's, it's, um, you gotta look at the big picture, what, what you're trying to accomplish. This is the nut. It is plastic. Kind of looks like bone, but it's not. And um, you'll see there's a light pencil mark on one side. And that's kind of my reference when I cut these slots. So everything's already been cut. Um, you want to make sure that it fits in the slot. Sometimes it might be a little tight. If it's a little loose, uh, I wouldn't be too concerned because you're going to glue it anyway. So that's a normal fit. You want the slots to basically be below the fret line or at least uh, very close to the same level. Now if the slots are not cut deep enough, say it sits like this, well the strings are going to go through here and they're not going to be resting on this zero nut. So it, the instrument isn't going to intonate properly when you fret it. The strings have to be resting on this zero nut. And the zero nut is like a, a placeholder for the strings. So if you need to, you might have to adjust the depth of these slots. I'll show you how to do that. have small files you can use those but um, this is just some 320 grit sandpaper folded in half and we're going to use it like a file and you really can't go too deep unless you uh, you just have to you know be careful not to go so deep that the nut cracks in half um, So you adjust those slots, and when you're happy with it, I would also check to make sure that each slot is wide enough, because some of these strings are wide, 
like the third and fourth string especially. So you want to make sure before you even glue it on that the strings are going to seat all the way to the bottom. And they do, no problem here. Sometimes this slot just won't be wide enough and the string will just kind of like sit on the top of it, of the slot. But everything checks out with this nut. Um, I would say the pencil side, those little pencil marks, uh, you would want to face them um, this direction because that's the way I mark everything out. It doesn't really matter, but it's probably going to be a better fit. Okay, let's glue this in place. Just use a tiny bit of wood glue. Just a drop. Put it in place, give it a little bit of pressure. And I'm going to use a clamp just to make sure it all dries in the right spot. I'll give that a few minutes to set up and then we'll put the strings on. dry. So now the pegs. You'll see one peg is shorter than the others and instead of having the hole for the string up at the top, it's closer to the base. So that's your fifth peg. pegs are tapered so the farther up you push them the harder it will be to turn them so we've decided which side is up which side is down on the, the drum it doesn't really matter it's just this is what I thought looked best so that's how I'm going to do it the tailpiece just slips on I usually start with the third string just to get things going third string is going to line up with the center line of the banjo. So you see where the two pieces of uh, the rim are glued together, there's that line. You can just line that up with the string. Now as we tighten these strings, it's going to get harder and harder to move this drum around. to loop the string over the peg um, on top of where the string goes in first and then as we tighten it up we go below where the string goes in and the idea is to get that string as close to the peg head as possible so you do have to guide it down with your thumb as you wind it around So it's kind of an art to uh, get these strings where they belong because naturally they're going to want to come, 
you're going to want to be uh, more towards the top of the peg. And that's not best because we want as much downward tension at the nut as possible. So always guide that string down. So it's important that you've tied the string onto the tailpiece nice and tight, and equally as important that you get it uh, get it going on the peg um, properly. Because if it slips on the peg, it's not going to stay in tune either. All right, the fifth string. You can see the fretboard has a little notch cut in it and this is kind of like the fifth string pip it's just a really simple way of doing it so the string will rest in that notch once you get it all put together And in this case, the string will have a tendency to uh, to ride really close to the neck, and you might have to actually guide it kind of away from the neck, just so you can uh, turn it freely. But there we go. So now all the strings are on. There's a little bit of tension on the strings, and already the drum is it's not going anywhere. And there's nothing holding it to the dowel except for the pressure of the strings. I mean, you, can, you can move it a little bit if you try, but uh, once we get it tuned up, it's, it's going to be there. Okay, the bridge. Your bridge might have a notch at the third string, and this notch should face the peg. It's it's kind of like a way to compensate for the, the way uh, Banjo's third string will intonate um, sharp in general. But uh, you may or may not get a bridge with this notch. Uh, I just get these bridges from different suppliers. So it really, I don't think it really matters, especially for this type of a banjo. So from the zero fret to the bridge, is the scale length and for this banjo, it's a small banjo, it'll be 22 inches. So you want to place the bridge 22 inches out and when you're playing it, if it doesn't sound right, you might need to move the bridge a little bit either way. You'll find that you'll find the right spot as you get used to your banjo. But we'll start at 22 inches. And also, a trick for figuring out the scale of any instrument with frets is the scale will always be double the first 12 frets. So, from 0 to 12, so from 0 to 12, it's 11 inches. Double that is 22 inches. That's a good little trick for finding where your bridge belongs. So I'll get this tuned up and you can hear it. As you tune, especially the first time, it helps to push these knots down, make them tighter. Then retune. And I'm tuning this banjo to the key of Open G, standard banjo tuning. You can tune it all kinds of different ways, but this is uh, the most common way, and uh, it sounds good, so that's what we're going to do. Um, the 
first and fourth strings are going to be a D. Okay, here's a little side-by-side -side comparison for you uh, with a couple of my other kits. The travel kit, the mountain kit, and the Americana kit. Um, they all have different uh, drum systems. So, the travel kit is just a, a frame with the skin tacked on it. The mountain uses this frame, well there's actually two of them, a top and a bottom, and it, the skin is actually attached to a steel hoop, a, a tone ring. So it's going to sound a lot different. And the Americana has a bent wood rim, no tone ring, but obviously the drum is much much bigger than on the travel. Now you can see the, the way we tack the skin onto this frame, it kind of creates the illusion that it's got a big drum, but um, it's really just about six inches. Now with this, uh, the drum really is about 12 inches across. So I'll play them all for you now so you can hear. Now I've, uh, I already have these two tuned to about the key of open E, which is a couple steps below standard tuning. Um, that's kind of what, what these banjos kind of always settle on for me. So for the sake of side-by-side, -side, I tuned this banjo down as well to match the same. They're all tuned exactly the same, so uh, you'll just know. Now I will take note that this is a smaller scale instrument, and it does, I think it actually sounds a lot better if it's tuned up to uh, like standard G tuning. And uh, you hear that in other parts of this video, but just for the side-by-side, -side, they're all going to be in the same tuning. Okay, you get an idea. It's not, it's not super loud, but I think it's enough volume to, uh, to practice at home. Maybe not a jam banjo, but you get the idea. Now the mountain banjo uses a similar size drum, but there is a tone ring in there and you'll hear the difference. It sounds more metallic and it's, it's, it's brighter. just like the minstrel banjo um, it, because it's it's the same drum setup I really think this this sounds the best honestly uh, and that's because it has a the largest drum. Alright, so I put the other banjos away and I 
I tuned this back up to G. So I would say it's it's a good notch louder and uh, just it's just a lot clearer sounding uh, tuned up higher and that makes sense because it's a short scale instrument so I would recommend you just tune it to G or somewhere in that neighborhood. It's good to hear the differences between the different models, but for me, um, they each have their own strengths and weaknesses. So. Um,